Have you ever wondered why you're here? I know you have, Brett. Have you ever wondered why you're here? What is the purpose for why you exist? Right? Sometimes we've asked that about our spouses or other people that are close to us in our lives. Why are you here? Um, this is a question that we have wrestled with for generations and generations and generations. Philosophers and um, scientists and theologians have wrestled with the question, why is there anything instead of nothing? Right? Even for those that contemplate existence apart from an idea or conception of God or some being that put everything into motion, that question still kind of bothers us. Why is there something and not nothing? For theologians that believe in and practice a faith in God, this being that created everything, their answer is, well, God, there is because God did. Because God, he spoke and the universe came into existence. And then maybe if we make it a little more personal and not just, well, why does matter exist? Why is there anything at all? But why does humankind exist? What is the purpose for humankind? That becomes another great question for us. Now, chances are, if you've been around for a number of years, you have thought about this. You've thought about what your purpose is, and perhaps you're even living out your purpose to some extent. You, know, you have amassed your resources and your talents and the things that you're interested in, and you have kind of determined for yourself, this is why I'm here on earth. Like, this is what I'm here for. This is, this is the thing that kind of defines and brings real weight to my existence. And we can do that in a variety of areas of our lives. We can do that professionally, right? Some people have gone out and they have, they have gone into a career that really gives them a great sense of purpose. Or we have lived out some of the roles that we have in life, like fathers and mothers, and aunts and uncles, right? And, and, and volunteers in an organization. And in those roles, in those capacities, we have found some purpose for our existence. Well, there is a, there's a theological answer to this question that has been provided to us. In fact, it came about hundreds of years ago, and children and adults still memorize it to this day, still memorize it and quote it. Uh, it comes from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, right? A catechism is kind of a, uh, an organized set of questions and answers that helps us to know uh, what we believe, right? It kind of organizes the thoughts that we have about a particular thing, and it helps us to understand what we believe. And the first question of this catechism is, what is the chief end of man? Like, before it gets into anything else, before it gets into uh, kind of the theology or understanding about God and God's nature, and is God one, or is God three, and has God existed forever, or did he come into being, before it gets into any of those questions, and there's lots of questions, Lots of questions, lots of answers. Um, you might want to read through it one of these days. But the first question is, what is the chief end of man? In other words, for what purpose do you and I exist? What are we here for? And, like, where are we headed? What is the chief end? Like, what is the, the, the kind of the full and final reason for our being? And it answers the question this way. It says, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Man's chief end, like where you and I are headed ultimately, as human beings created in the image of God, our chief end is to glorify God. That is to magnify the weight of who God is and further and beyond just simply walking around as little glory objects of our creator. It is built into our end that we enjoy God forever. So how are we doing in those regards, both in the way in which we are glorifying or honoring God with our lives and our being, our existence, and, and beyond that, do you enjoy God? Do you enjoy God? Now, those of you that are in the room this morning, of course you enjoy God, right? I mean, why would you be here otherwise? Certainly not for me. Maybe it's for some other people in the room. 
No, we are here collectively, probably, because we have come and we have arrived at some place where we have come to enjoy what it means to be in relationship with God, and we're hoping to grow in our relationship with God and to grow in our understanding of who God is. So this is a great question and a great thing for us to remember as we think about ultimately maybe what God's purpose is for us, and that is that not only do we glorify and honor him, but that we actually enjoy what that means. A lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people think that to be religious uh, is largely defined as a a whole host of uh, restrictions on fun behavior, right? That if you're going to be a religious person, if you're going to be a God lover, well, then that by definition means that there's all kinds of fun things that human beings love to do that you are restricted from doing. That's what it means to be a person who loves and honors God. This statement makes kind of a different, or takes a different take on what true enjoyment of life and existence is, and that is to actually enjoy being in relationship with God. So in this series, we've been looking at some of the superlatives that we find in the Gospels as we look at the greatest of all time. What does it mean to experience greatness in God's kingdom? Last week, we began um, kind of what will today ultimately be this two-part mini-series on the question, what is the greatest commandment? And the reason why it takes us a couple weeks is because Jesus when he was asked what is the greatest commandment, actually gave us two. And so I want to spend a little time looking at the second one this morning. I get it. Like, I'm breaking kind of my own rules about, like, moving from just the greatest to even the second greatest. But I think you'll probably agree by the end of it that it's important that we do this. All right, so let's dive in. We're going to reread the scriptures from last week, Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 31. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there and read together along with us. And one of the scribes came up and heard them, that is Jesus um, and uh, this religious group of people, uh, disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, right, all of their questions, good and bad, Jesus continued one after another to answer all of these questions well. He asked them, which commandment is the most important of all? This is a great question for a rabbi uh, to answer. And I don't know that there was a tremendous degree of variance among what uh, people would say, but perhaps there must have been some. So so inquisitive was this person to find out what Jesus' take on was on what is the most important commandment of all. And Jesus answered, the most important is, and he quotes uh, these words that all of the good religious Hebrew people quoted themselves every single day. Every single day, they, they echoed this quotation that comes out of the book of Deuteronomy, the, the, the words of which are, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So the simple answer to the question, Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And we looked at this last week. The answer is, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. This is the most important. That is, you get this one right, you're going to do really, really well with everything else that follows after, right? So love God with all your heart. But then Jesus, he says, I'm not finished. And he had another thing to add to this, and this does not come out of the book of Deuteronomy. This is not kind of the rest of the quotation, but it is still found in the ancient scriptures, And again, our words that were very familiar to the ears of the people listening, Jesus says the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. If we were to take all of the commandments, that is all the things that we are commanded to do, as well as all of the prohibitions against any of the things that we shouldn't do, none of them, not one of them outranks in importance or in kind These two commandments, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the question that I immediately want for us to ask of ourselves as we read through this text is, does the order of these commandments matter? 
Does the order of these commandments matter? And the reason is because of how we sort of introduce the topic today. What is the chief end of man? Well, the chief end of man is to, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Right now, that, that answer belongs to a category of people, people that subscribe to that. I happen to be one of them. Perhaps you are as well. There are a lot of people that don't believe that. There are a lot of people in the world today, if you were to ask them what is the purpose for our existence, their answer would be far, far different from to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Right? For some people, they would say, well, there really is no purpose. Like, we're just, we just are. We, we're, we're just here. Uh, and because there is, in their mind, no ultimate supreme and eternal being to whom we are accountable, and because all that is is what is physical and what is before us, and so once your life is gone, well, then so is your existence, right? I mean, that's a fairly purposeless existence. That is, a, that is an, an existence whose purpose can only, can only survive for as long as that person is alive or exists. For some people who, you know, maybe are, uh, uh, you know, curious about what else may be out there, maybe they don't have this, the, the same kind of codified understanding of, uh, of God, like the eternal God, the one uh, supreme God that we in particular worship, but they, there, there's some thought for, well, there's some being out there, and, um, and so, you know, yeah, there's, there's, there's purpose to our lives, but it could, it could be far different from this thought, well, to, our purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So does the order of these things matter? Because <laughs> there would also be, I think, a lot of disagreement between those who would consider the first commandment to be of essential importance and the second one to be just that. The second one, uh, it would probably be far more a popular opinion that the second one is more important than the first one, right? For, I would dare say, for most people currently alive today, if we were to poll all seven plus billion people in the world today and say, which is the more important thing to you, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever or to love your neighbor as yourself, most people most people would actually categorize the second one as being the most important, right? Because as far as they're concerned, either the order doesn't matter, or those two things are so closely linked that they are inseparable, or, well, the first one doesn't matter at all, right? Because they don't prescribe to the same idea that there is a God to whom is owed our love, our wholehearted love, the kind of love we talked about last week. I mean, step onto the campus of any of our universities, any single one, you are not going to find the prevailing opinion at that university campus to be, hey, more than anything, students, after your four years are up here, more than anything, we want you to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. You are not going to find posters up on the walls extolling the virtues of what it means to be in a relationship, a love relationship with God at any of our university campuses. What you will find, what you will find is certainly... Uh, all kinds of paraphernalia and communication and, uh, and emphasis on, hey, get along with each other, love each other, tolerate one another, learn to be in community with other people who aren't like you, all of which are great and wonderful things, right? But that is, that's considered to be the high and holy virtue of the human experience. And listen, I, I, th there's nothing wrong with that, Right? But I think that there is a little bit of an upside-down nature to the priorities and, more importantly, an opportunity for the church, for those who actually love God, to make or to have a, 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 a to, to set a difference for what real love means among ourselves. I ended the message last week with a couple of statements, and I just want to remind us of them here this morning. First, we can't fulfill the second commandment until we fully embrace the first. You can't fully 
fulfill the second commandment until you fully embrace the first. Now, I am not saying that it is impossible for a human being to express love to another human being until they first love God. I am not saying that. That would be nonsense. Like, we have all done that. We have all, whether we are in relationship with God today or not, we have at some point in our lives not been in a love relationship with God where at that very same time we actually showed and demonstrated love to other people, right? And people all over the world do that. Like, you don't have to love God first in order for you to show any degree of love to one another. So that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that you can't utterly fulfill the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself until you fully embrace the first. The degree to which I fail in loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength has some determining influence on my ability to actually and fully love you. Here's why. Love without God can sometimes be reduced to simply not hating other people. The kind of love that is often emphasized in the world today is a love that we could otherwise define as don't hate each other. Don't hate each other. Don't hate people who are different from you. Don't hate people who think differently from how you think, right? Uh, uh, the, 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 the big word for years now has been tolerance. Learn tolerance. This is a virtue that we have exalt, exalted, we have extolled kind of the, the highest level of humanity, right? That what is required of each of us is that we tolerate one another. Now, I think that's hilarious. I think it's, you know why? Because I ask like, really? Is that the bar we're setting? Like, that we just want to tolerate one another? Right? Some people think that this is a high and lofty virtue, and I'm like, really? Is that it? Like, is that the extent to which we're supposed to go in a relationship with each other? Like, how would you feel if I just came out here and talked about how tolerable you all are? Thank you for being so tolerable. Right? Like, I'm so glad that I've come to the place in my life currently where I don't hate your guts. Oh, it's such a freeing and relieving feeling to know that I don't hate you like I once hated you. I have learned to tolerate you. I've learned to tolerate your behavior. I've learned to tolerate your existence. Really? Like, is that what we're going for in humanity? For some, that's enough. You see it all over the place. Tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. Like, that's the bar. Christian love, real Christian love that originates from a full embracing of love for God with all my being and then flows outward toward other people will achieve far, far more than tolerance. Now, a lot of people don't, they don't, they don't see or think of people that are church people in that way because the church has often done itself a great disservice in the amount and the degree to which they have loved other people. We'll get, we'll get there in, in a few moments, don't you worry. But let me point out, a love that is separated from and exists without the context of love for God first can be, and here's part of the deficiency of that kind of love, it can be reduced to simply not hating other people. That's not the kind of love that I want to define my love. Secondly, love without God is often not proactive, okay? Th again, this is another deficiency in the kind of love that's been separated from, removed from, and not inspired by a love first and foremost for God. The love without God is often not proactive. Real love, real love Move. Real love is proactive. Real love initiates something. You know, we as human beings, we do a fantastic job at reacting to things. Right? We do. Like, in, in, not just in negative ways, but even in positive ways sometimes. You know, this past week, we hit another anniversary of September 11th. Right? 19 years ago, planes flew into buildings. Thousands of people were killed in just a relatively short few moments. 
And immediately, people rallied, right? There were those who responded, who many of them gave their lives in trying to help those who were perishing, right? There were those who put themselves on the line because we do that as human beings. We are amazingly and wonderfully resilient in this regard. Uh, the care that we have for one another. That's why fire departments exist. Right? That's why emergency services exist. Because there are people that are actually inclined to living out their lives in service for others. When a catastrophe hits, and we see the news of an earthquake that has taken thousands or tens of thousands of lives, or a hurricane and a tsunami affects the lives of literally thousands of people. For some of us, our hearts are tweaked. For others, there is actually like a real physical response to that thing. A person gets on an airplane and flies halfway across the world to participate in some humanitarian relief effort to help bring relief to those who are hurting, to those who are perishing. We do that. We react, and that's wonderful. That's wonderful. It's wonderful that our love allows us when we are confronted with the difficulty another person experiences to, to respond in kind, in love. That's great. But the kind of love that we experience as an outflow from this love that first finds its origin in a love for God, it is proactive. It is a love that cares about people before they need to be cared about. It is a love that looks beyond even the simple needs or immediate relief that a person may need in their life. It looks to what is their deepest need, what is their eternal need. I'm glad that there are all kinds of ways in which the human race is involving itself and helping to to care for others, right? I mean, you think about all of the, the, the organizations that have come up because somebody had a heart for some, some category of people that, have, uh, that are going through great difficulty. Think about poverty. Uh, you think about famine. You think about lack of education. You think about the problem of human trafficking. Right? You think about all these various kinds of real catastrophes, real human catastrophes that exist in our world today, and, and there are people who rise up in order to be a solution, or at least part of a solution for those things, right? We want to feed the hungry. We want to provide water for the thirsty. We want to rescue those who have been trafficked. We want to help bring up those who are just stuck in poverty with no hope of ever getting out of there themselves. Right? We, we run to aid in all of these various problems, and, and it's absolutely essential that we do that. I believe that is a reflection on what it means to be people who've been created in God's image. Like, God's love is an initiating kind of love. And if our love finds its source in first and foremost loving God with all our heart, then we too will have to be proactive in extending that same love. And not only extending the love, but, but demonstrating a love that goes beyond just the physical needs, that sees a person as a person who has created and bears the image of God in themselves and is a person that God is infinitely in love with and that God desperately wants to have a relationship with. And so we see, I need to not only feed that person, I, I, I need to be concerned for the eternal soul of that person. And then finally, love without God is limited to the capacity of love that I have for myself. The commandment was, love your neighbor as yourself. And even in this commandment, there's a little bit of a deficiency here. You know how I know that? I know that for a couple of reasons. For one thing, I know that you and I are incapable of loving ourselves perfectly. Like, again, if the benchmark is set at love your neighbor as yourself, that's a great, and that's a high benchmark. It's wonderful. But how many of you love yourselves perfectly? You don't, right? I know that because this morning 
he chose to eat donuts instead of nuts and berries. Right? If you loved yourself, you would have eaten nuts and berries. But because you don't love yourself perfectly, you made a, you made a choice that is detrimental to your health, right? You ate the donut. No, we, we don't always make the right decisions for ourselves. Have you, ever, have you ever made a decision in your life that hurt you? Everybody said yes, please. Yes. We've all done that. We'll, we'll do it again. We will actually make decisions that will invite pain and suffering into our lives because we can't love ourselves perfectly. Right? So there's some, there's some degree of deficiency in a love if, if I just simply love others as I love myself, even, even that, like, it doesn't quite get there. It doesn't, it doesn't bring me to that place of what it means to love perfectly. Jesus himself, he even, he changed it. Like, so he tells this guy, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? He's quoting from the commandments of Scripture. But then later on, as Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry among his disciples and in this world, before he goes to the cross, he tells his disciples this. Not love each other like you love yourself. No. He says, I'm going ra- to raise the bar a little higher. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. That is a love that is not separated from an origin that finds itself in a love for God. You know how Jesus loves us? He loves us perfectly. He loves you better than you love you. Some of you maybe didn't know that or never really thought of it that way, right? Because you had this idea that God, maybe he loves you, but he doesn't really like you all that much sometimes. We fall into the trap of that kind of thinking. But God is incredibly in love with each of you. God loves you perfectly. He loves you infinitely. He loves you unconditionally. Boy, we love to throw that word unconditional. We just love to throw it around. You know, like it's a five-cent word. You know what unconditional means? No, you don't. Neither do I. Like we, we, we can't even emotionally really grab onto, latch onto, and hold on to the idea of what real unconditional love is. So conditional is our love. Some of you loved me before these last few moments, and now you love me a little less. <laughs> right? Our love, our love is just, it's, it's, it's conditional, it's not perfect, but Jesus says, hey, Here's, here's the bar I want to set. Here's what I want you to aspire to in your love for one another. Even as I have loved you, so love one another. Jesus' love was perfectly, perfectly sacrificial. It was perfectly selfless. And that's the kind of love that he wants for us to demonstrate to one another. So we cannot, I say all that to say this, we cannot really fully live out the second commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves until we have fully embraced the commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm sorry that I spent so much time on that, but I think it's really, really important for us to be sure that we get in order the commandments, even as Jesus ordered them. In fact, uh, maybe you noticed this, maybe you didn't, but this week, The scriptures came out of the ESV. Usually we use the NLT. I didn't use the NLT because the NLT, uh, it translates uh, thought for thought. It kind of looks at what the ancient writers wrote, really tries to get the expression of what they were saying and translate it into words that really, really make sense in our English today. But the NLT says, when it quotes Jesus, it has him saying, The second commandment is equally important to the first. Jesus didn't actually say that. Right? Jesus said the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second, and he called it the second, 
He ranked it second in importance. I mean, it's like 1A and 1B. I mean, they are, like, don't try to separate them because you can't. Like, they really go hand in hand with one another. But you can't ultimately and fully fulfill the second commandment until you have first embraced fully the first. On the other hand, and we kind of ended things last week with this, and I remind you of it again today, you can't obey the first command if you ignore the second. Now, this is for all you holy rollers out there, right? All you people that consider kind of the, the, the relationship that you have with God to be so perfect and so in order, and nobody can touch you in terms of your spirituality and your holiness and your righteousness. Like, you, I mean, you've got it all together. You've got it all figured out. I mean, nobody holds a candle to the degree to which you love God. But, but there seems to be a real disconnect in the love that you demonstrate toward other people, right? This is kind of like, you know, when you tell that person who says they're happy but are wearing the angry face, when you tell them, hey, I think you need to tell your face how happy you are, right? Because your face hasn't gotten the message. You can't obey the first commandment. You cannot claim, you cannot lay claim to, oh yeah, I love God, if you ignore the second. Years after Jesus ministered on the earth, and the church was born, and churches started popping up all over the place, and they evolved from simple little kind of meetings in homes to actual congregations and organized sets of people, like people who would identify themselves with a church. Like, I go to the church in Ephesus. I go to the church in Thessalonica. I go to the church on Westview Drive, Curtis Lake Christian Church, right? When, uh, when now years have passed, and all kinds of real-life Christian experience has been had, John the Apostle, who outlived all of the other apostles, said in a letter that he wrote generally to the church in 1 John 4, 19-20, he says, we love each other because he loved us first. That is, we love each other because Jesus loved us first. And then he said, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer... That person is a liar, liar, pants on fire. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? You know why John wrote this? Because he saw it. He witnessed this. He actually went and talked to people who just couldn't be more effusive about how much they loved God. And then he'd see them practice preference for one person over another. He'd see them or hear them talking, gossiping maybe, about another person when that person wasn't around. He saw people mistreating one another while still trying to lay claim to, oh, I love God. Yeah, I love God. John says, no. You cannot say, I love God, but at the very same time, hold anger, hold, hold hatred in your heart toward another person. If you do, you're a liar. You have, you've maybe fooled yourself into thinking that those two things can coexist one, with one another, but they don't. He says it doesn't even make sense. This doesn't even jive logically. How can you, if you can't love people you can see, like people that are right there, right in front of you, people that are within the proximity to you physically, if you can't love them, how can, how can you possibly claim that you love a God you can't even see? He cannot. We cannot pretend to be following the first commandment to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength if we are ignoring God wants us to love one another. What does that mean? Well, it means loving 
what God loves. To love God, to truly love God with all our being, means to love what God loves. Some of you have children who have adopted a love for something that you love. Like your love for something was actually conveyed to another person. This is why chances, are, like if you, if you follow a particular sports team, like, you know, you're a raging Patriots fan and you can't wait to see what happens today in game number one for the New England Patriots. What is this year going to look like, right? You're, you're a rabid raging Patriots fan. Chances are you might have a child that would adopt that same love and weird affection for some sports franchise that you have, right? Our, our kids, we, we convey that love. Loving God means loving what God loves. You know what God loves? God loves you. He loves every single one of you. The Bible says it declares we are created in the image of God, that we bear his likeness, and that we are now infinitely and unconditionally the objects of his great love. God, you, you can't believe how much God loves you. So if I love God, that means necessarily I love what God loves, which means necessarily I tolerate you. No. I'm sorry, we fixed that, right? No, not I tolerate, not I put up with you. I love you. And loving each other then trains us in our love for God. This is <laughs> the opportunity that we have to express love for one another actually gives us the playground, the practice area for what it means to love God. God, he provides each of us opportunities to love one another. And in doing that, we actually put flesh and bone to what real love is, a real love toward God. I think that's why when Jesus says, if someone gives a cup of water to he who is thirsty, he who is considered to be the least of these, it is as if he has done it to me. That there is this kind of substitutionary weight to the love that we extend to one another. It is, it is an expression of our love for God. My loving you the way that God loves you. James put it this way in James 2.14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? What kind of faith? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Like What kind of faith? Like What brand of faith are you peddling? that just lays claim to some faith, but then it doesn't back it up with anything. There's, no, there's nothing behind it. There's no substance. There's no real work behind it. Can that kind of faith save anybody? Is that the brand of faith that we're going toward? Love is a movement outward. Love is a movement outward. Right? We talked about how like, why love, our love for one another can't be disconnected with our love for God because it's deficient. It's deficient in its character and its nature. Real love is, is a movement outward. It doesn't stay here at home where it's safe and sound. It doesn't just echo sentiments on Facebook or some other social media platform. It is a movement outward. There's substance behind it. There's a reality, a gritty, hard reality to what that love is. Love is a movement outward. How does it move outward? Well, a couple of ways, and I close with this, a couple of ways that the kind of love for your neighbor extends itself and becomes a reality in our world is it, in some cases, bridges the gap of injustice with sacrifice. This real love that is a movement outward, when it sees injustice, it can't sit idly by, but must act when so inspired to do so. It recognizes that injustices in the world occur because we live in a broken, we live in a harsh, we live in a difficult, we live in an evil world. A world where there's a gap between those who are living Injustice in those that are not. And love says, I will 
make sacrifices in order to bridge the gap that exists where injustice lives. That is a love that moves outward. It is a love that expresses itself in more than just words. You know, these days, it's popular where something happens in our world for there to be this sudden kind of eruption. You know, among those who talk, those who have voices. And listen, as important as it is for us to echo sentiments when we see injustice occurring, far, far more beneficial is our actually putting our feet and our hands to the work of fixing injustice. Love bridges the gap. And then finally, love demonstrates compassion with generosity. Love says, I will, I'll dip my hands into my pockets and I will do something when I am confronted with the suffering of another person. It is moved with compassion and it responds in kind. We're going to have an opportunity to initiate generosity in a couple of weeks when we have Global Outreach Sunday. And when we say, in the advancing of God's kingdom throughout our world and bringing relief and hope and love to people that don't know Christ, to those who haven't had an opportunity to experience his love for themselves, you have an opportunity to participate. You can participate financially. You can participate in volunteering. You can participate in getting on an airplane and flying across the world. Love demonstrates compassion with generosity. This is the kind of love that defines, that marks the kingdom of God. It's the greatest kind of love. Love God with all your heart, all your soul all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray together. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just seal in our hearts this desire to embrace fully what it means to deeply fall in love with you and to live out that love in a way that expresses itself to the other human beings that you have put in our life, that you have put in our way. For some of us today, that means we must forgive another person that has hurt us terribly, that has wounded us, that has left us wondering how could a person ever do this to another person. Lord, I pray that you would just allow us to find healing in the midst of that woundedness and embrace what it means to forgive in that moment. Father, I pray that you would help us to demonstrate love as you provide opportunities for us with other human beings that come across our path that are desperately in need of compassion, that are desperately in need of uh, relief in the injustice that they're experiencing in their own lives. God, would you help our love to be the kind of love that initiates, that moves forward, that has real substance behind it? Let us live in this kind of love, the kind of love that you have set the example for us when you, when you paid the price for our sin, for our abandonment of what you wanted for our lives. Lord, I pray, help us to live out that kind of love. In Christ's name, amen. The band's going to lead us in a song. I just pray that as we sing this together, that you will reflect on the love that Jesus has demonstrated for you and that when you leave this place, you're going to be ready to go out in the world, love your neighbor as yourself. No, better even as Christ has loved you, has communicated through this song, so love one.